we'll take some questions. Maybe we'll take our first question from the audience here, and then that'll give a chance for any of the folks who are on webcast with us who would like to share a question. Uh, please just type your question in, and uh, we'll do our best to answer it as we see them pop up. So anybody uh, in the room got a question, want to start us off? Don't be shy. Oh, lady in the back was first. <coughs> Um, sorry, we need to repeat the question. Oh, sorry. The audience can The hear. question is how long are the tissue samples kept? And there, there are guidelines that have come out of the Canadian Association of Pathologists and the uh, College of American Pathologists in this regard. Generally speaking, uh, the uh, slides are kept for at least 10 years. And uh, we're actually encouraging uh, for patients with a cancer diagnosis that we should actually be saving the slides and the blocks uh, indefinitely. At least that's my feeling, especially with what's happening with all this personalized medicine and go, being able to go back and analyze your samples and looking for uh, hereditary situations as well. I feel fairly strongly that we should be actually keep capturing these or keeping these samples for a much longer time than we are. But a lot of the issues is practical. Where do you, where do you store samples? Because in a, in a hospital pathology lab like uh, at Trillium Health Partners, we have like 40,000 cases a year. So, it, and if each case is, you know, uh, is even if it's like uh, two or three slides, that's a huge amount of glass that has to be uh, stored. So you have to have uh, you know offsite storage, and you have to have ways of accessing that as well. So all all those practical issues. So it's a matter of trying to balance, uh, trying to main, keep as uh, keep the important cases that you want to keep, especially the cancer cases, and the other things one could uh, discard a little bit quicker. Another question. That was one of my questions. Well, but uh, another question on the hereditary genetic side of kidney cancer, um, what would be the benefit of knowing if you have that genetic uh, predisposition to kidney cancer, if somebody already in your family, like is the treatment options different, wouldn't they still be following your family if there was more than one person in your family with kidney cancer the same way? For, um, forewarned is forearmed. So the so if you have a family history of <clears throat> some kidney cancers but you don't have any genes then then uh, people in that family have a slightly increased risk a very slightly increased risk of ever developing a, a kidney cancer and because generally the the risk is is for over the population is small that slightly increased risk isn't isn't that much so if there's no gene involved then then it's not a situation where intensive surveillance is currently recommended. However, if we do know that there's a gene involved, if we know what that gene is, then that um, tells us to be um, much more active with the surveillance of the family members. But it also tells us the pattern. So um, it's less clear in some of the rarer subtypes of hereditary cancer. But in VHL, von Hippel-Lindau families, the kind of mutation that's passed down really determines the kinds of problems that those families will have. So some families won't have very much kidney cancer, but they'll have cancers of the adrenal gland or cancers of some of the glands near the blood vessels, or they'll have um, cysts on the liver. So it depends on the, if knowing, knowing the mutation really, really helps you to do the right tests and follow the right people within the, within the family. But if there's no gene specifically, then at the moment, there's the, the, then the indications for surveillance become much more sort of difficult. We're actually in the process of actually trying to write some guidelines for hereditary cancer testing and who to test for, um, and they'll be they'll be published um, hopefully very soon. We have a question. Um, we have several questions that we'll try to get to uh, from those on our webcast. Um, one that we hear a lot is: there a specific food or vegetable I can eat that will help prevent uh, that helps fight cancer? <laughs> Dib's, Dib's saying chocolate and wine chocolate and everything. And wine. <laughs> no. no. <laughs> No, there, there's, 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 there's not. There's, there, is a, there is an increased risk of many cancers with obesity. So, uh, you, you know, don't, don't, don't be overweight. He says sucking, he says <laughs> sucking, <laughs> sucking in his stomach. We have an answer for you. <laughs> um, so don't be overweight. So, you know, a, a diet that's um, high in fruit and vegetables, that's um, healthy with lots of exercise, is, is what's good for you. There's a, there's a really good um, diet, uh, um, author called, who's written a book called The Omnivore's Dilemma, and in defense of food, I can't remember the author's name, but his, his, um, his mantra is, eat food, not too much, 
mostly vegetables. Okay, we have another question. I have RCC that is a slow growing cancer. What makes it slow growing? So, so what makes it slow growing is something that I said and Dr. Shrigley said is that the grade of the tumour is often often what's what's telling there. So if it's a lower grade tumour where the, the cells are more organised and look more like normal cells than cancer cells as opposed to high grade where the cancer cells are very, very disorganised. And that feeds back into what, what I was talking about with the music. If you've only got one or two changes in the notes or in your music score in the DNA, one or two changes in the genes, then you can actually have a very slow growing kind of cancer. If you are unlucky and get lots and lots and lots of changes in the music, then, then, then you'll face the music a bit sooner. Yes? I have a question. Dr. Getty, you mentioned this new group of drugs that you know, still on the test. Yeah. And you said they're very exciting, but you didn't really explain why you find them exciting. <laughs> Um, I find them exciting because they're working in mul multiple different kinds of cancer. Um, they've worked in kidney cancer, but they're also working in melanoma. Um, I work with a group of doctors uh, in melanoma here at the, at the hospital, and we have clinical trials with these. And I can't, we're, we're in the middle of a clinical trial, and I can't talk to tell you about numbers. But, and they're, they're like any other drug, they're still a failure in some patients. But in some patients, they've been... Um, extremely exciting. <laughs> I think the comment was bloody exciting. Yeah, yeah. And so, and so the, 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 a couple of these drugs have been, uh, have been reported in the New England Journal of Medicine in June of last year. And they, again, they, they failed in three out of four patients. But when they worked in that one out of four patients, the, the results were frankly spectacular and lasted for a very, very long time with very acceptable toxicities, very very manageable toxicities. So the immune system was the very first treatment that we had for cancer. It was a, in about 100 years ago we had, this, we had this horrible immune treatment for cancer. And I think we're coming full circle and we're going to develop more of these immune treatments for, for longer lasting benefits in, pa in many patients with many cancers. I just, I just want to ask how long so they're, they're rapidly they're rapidly coming to, to clinical trials. So the, the clinical trial that we're part of with the melanoma with this one drug that had a code name, we knew about it um, middle of last year with a code name. It's just got a name. It's the f it's the biggest fastest occurring trial I've ever seen. The phase three is opening fast. The 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 doctors are working better with pharmaceutical companies to when when things really start to work we work very fast to move things through to clinic as quickly as possible will this be, uh, be the next question is will, will it be funded um, that's another <laughs> another <laughs> problem as well but we are moving things faster at the clinic it used to take us you know five years things are it's one to two years one to two to three years to get things moving so we're we, we are getting better at that the other thing is that um, as I said like all these tumors now have very specific uh, signatures, genetic signatures, molecular signatures, and that work is incredibly exciting. And as we get into new technology like whole gene sequencing, uh, which is a technology of looking at the, the whole genetic uh, code of a tumor, we're going to be able to identify specific areas and, and pathways in that tumor that could be targeted. So we have uh, drugs like Herceptin in breast cancer, you know, or, or some of the drugs in, in lung cancer now that we are able to sort of have a companion diagnostic, then a very specific drug that can be used uh, associated with that too. So I think there's going to be some wonderful opportunities in, uh, in kidney cancer because, I mean, it really is a genetic, there's so many genetic markers and molecular markers and the group at NIH that, that Andrew was talking about had just done some tremendous work, you know, in this whole field of defining the genetics of, uh, of not just hereditary cancer, but sporadic cancer, too, in the kidney. I'm going to take one more from the web, and then we'll take a couple more, and then, unfortunately, we've uh, got to wrap things up. Um, Deborah W., I think, was next. Uh, Anastasia. 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 Uh, I had a left laparoscopic radical nephrectomy in 2011. My doctor slash surgeon is a urologist. Should I be in contact with an oncologist as well? So that's a, that's a really good, good question. question. Um, and that was what I was trying to speak to in terms of uh, the insurance policy treatment, the adjuvant treatment. So that's the treatment in many cancers we will, uh, the medical oncologist, the, which, is, which is me, might offer a treatment after your surgery. 
but we don't know yet in kidney cancer. So the, the very best treatment, you know, it, it pains me to say that another group of doctors is better than me, but the very best treatment for kidney cancer at the moment is surgery. And if you've had a, if you've had a good procedure, I'm sure you have a good, a good operation with your surgeon, then that's the right, the right doctor for you. If, God forbid, you know, if someone runs into trouble, if the cancer is, comes back or it starts to spread, that's when we, we come into the picture. Um, for kidney cancer, but at the moment there's no there's no additional treatment to do at this stage. So um, stick with stick with your surgeon and um, plenty of fruit and vegetables. I think the gentleman at the back. I have a couple of very quick questions um, for patients in uh, post-surgical diagnostic screening with CT images. There a typical rule of thumb of how big a new or recurring term tumor would have to be to actually visibly show up on a diagnostic scan? That that varies. Um, Often, often the sort of the rule of thumb is sort of a centimeter. You know, you start to get suspicious o o um, over a centimeter for a lymph node. But if there's a new spot that wasn't there before, if you've got a this, the the slices between the 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 scans, uh, the slight the the distance between the slices on a scan is usually either three millimeters or five millimeters. So if you see a spot that's new. It wasn't there before, and it's and then it's, you see it again on an, another scan, and it's if it's bigger, then that five millimeters is often a is a marker that makes you particularly suspicious, or if there's a a, a spread or, or, or something like that. Thanks. My other question was on pathology and survivorship data. Do you know this is often published never longer than for ten rolling years? Is there any reason why it's just ten years? Are any plans to offer data for fifteen, twenty? Oh, I, I think a lot of the times it's just because the studies haven't been carried carried out that long. I think you know, a lot of the databases now that people are, are starting for, for kidney cancer, for all cancers, are actually looking way out now, 20, 25, 30 years, yeah. But I, and it just as informatics has evolved, it's, it's much easier now to do that. Uh, you know, so like when you're talking about breast cancer or prostate cancer, you're talking often 20 or 30 year survivor. And I think the same will be for, you know, for kidney cancer too. There'll be uh, long, long term survivor curves. Great, thank you. John? Yes. Um, if the uh, cancer uh, occurred and uh, you established a grain for the original cancer when you removed it, uh, um, is the uh, grade changing at all, or is it just basically remain the same grade as it was when it was the uh, original diagnostic? Well, it, some, sometimes it's the same, but sometimes it progresses as well. So sometimes you see, uh, when you're looking at uh, the recurrence of a, of a cancer, whether it's a local recurrence or a metastasis in a different site, the grade has actually progressed. So it's not uncommon to see that. One thing I didn't cover is that uh, often within a tumor, there is variation in the grade. So there is, uh, you, you might have like 90% of the tumor is like grade one, but there's one little area that's grade three. So what the pathologist does in that situation is you go by the worst area. And generally speaking, it's that, that more aggressive clone of cells, that, that higher grade, is the one that goes on to metastasize. But sometimes even in the metastasis, it changes even more and becomes even more aggressive. Gentlemen at the back, and unfortunately, we'll have to cut our questions at that point. You, <laughs> uh, seven years ago, when I had my partial nephrectomy, the C gene was the uh, was the uh, the gene that, that was available for testing. Uh, are there any newer genes available for gene testing? So CMET is a is a, is an oncogene. Um, it depends on the kind of cancer. So the the papillary types of cancer. Um, are thought to be are thought to be driven by mutations in that cancer, and that's what um, Dr. Shrigley was was speaking to is that the different the different changes in the music, the different mutations are associated with these different subgroups of the cancer, and so we are finding more and more of these and finding newer ways of treating these. So there's now a new class of drugs that are actually treating the the MET oncogene as well. That's they're they're in, still in earlier phase clinical trials, but they're showing some interesting results as well. Thank you. I want to thank everybody for their questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to everybody's on the webcast and, and in the room. We probably could have gone on for another half an hour or so, but uh, we do appreciate the feedback from you folks, and certainly um, Kidney Cancer Canada greatly appreciates your participation tonight. We have a little gift in thanks. <laughs>